All right, well, we're hereby gathered to talk about workflow sets and stacks put together. So the motivation for this was stacks has been on my plate in trying to just wrap my head around it. And after Tony's presentation on workflow sets, I decided, okay, like let's let's knock out two at once that I really wanted to find out more about and let's see how they play together. So workflow sets, uh, just to rejog our memory, is a package that allows us to create, fit, and tune a large number of models with a few familiar commands that, that we have grown to, to know through our journey with tiny models. And this package is, we saw that it was really useful in the earlier stages of discovery when you just want to try out a bunch of different types of models and different pre-processing techniques. And Stacks is a package that is also in the tidy models ecosystem and it allows for ensembling. And we'll see what that's about um, later on. So I'm gonna start with just the packages that we will be requiring today. So a lot of them are familiar here, Tidyverse, Janitor, Tidy Models, Rules, Baguette, Workflow Sets, Fine Tune, and then Stacks. And this little workshop tutorial situation is working off of Tony's presentation in chapter 15, where he used the 2021 World Happiness Report data set. And so a lot of the code here hopefully will be familiar and hopefully I didn't make any errors either. So first, we're just going to import it, clean the column names, uh, select our outcome variable, which will be ladder score. That's the happiness score. And then we're going to be working with a few predictor variables, uh, logged GDP per capita, measures for social support, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity, and perceptions of corruption. These are all numeric variables. So I'll be going over these quickly and with not too much explanation because we've seen this a lot, but nonetheless, I, I put down some notes about what's going on. But our first step is, of course, splitting into training and test set. I'm doing some stratified sampling here on the ladder score outcome variable, and I'm doing tenfold cross validation. Next, we specify our recipes. So we'll be having two. Um, the first one is where we normalize all our predictors because some models require them to be so. And our second recipe is going to be called our polynomial recipe where we're doing quad quadratic terms and we're setting up uh, interactions as well. So step three is our model specifications. So Tony showed us the amazing parsnip add-in, which I'm still trying to get over. It's just incredible, saves so much time. And it's awesome because it also tags the tuning parameters for you and specifies them. So that's a big time saver as well, because there's no way I could remember any of these. So I'm going to be using the same uh, models as uh, Tony did last time. So step five is creating our workflow sets. So we're actually going to start with three and then combining them. So the first one is for the models using recipe norm. So that was that normalized recipe. Workflow set two will be for the polynomial recipes and workflow set three is for the models that don't require any of those pre-processing steps. So for the first one, for models requiring normalization, 
it's our SVM models and our K nearest neighbor model. For the polynomials, we have um, linear regression and also K nearest neighbors. Is that right? For yeah, polynomial, but does it use, although I was like following along with the last tweets as well. So, so it gets the additional terms in this case, it's okay. Okay, cool. And then the third workflow set, which contains the models that don't require any uh, of the pre-processing we've specified. So that's gonna be our random forest and our back trees and our Mars model. And then we're gonna just bring them all together with bind rows. And it's that easy because essentially, as, as we've seen, I think throughout the tidy models book, everything is a tibble. Uh, so it's very flexible that way. And then we can do some spot checking and see what sets looks like. And it's indeed a tibble containing all the models specifications. So once our <coughs> workflow sets are set up, we can tune all the models contained in them. And the type of grid search we're going to do is called a racing approach. And there's more details about that in chapter 13, but it's a more efficient, uh, less computationally intensive way of doing grid search. And I'm setting it up here to use up to 100 different parameter candidates. Uh, last time, Tony used five, I believe, and it still took like half an hour to run. This took four hours to run. And my I'd like to think my computer is pretty new and, and performant. So it's a big one. Uh, but... So did you have to turn on, sorry, did you have to turn on the parallelization for that? Like, is there a, like a command to? I did not do anything special here. I know there's an okay. argument here called parallel over. I'm uh, not sure if this speeds things up or not. I, I think it's in the book. I, I think I've seen Julia do it where I forget the package. Tan might know it if he wants to if he wants to bail me out here, but um, you have to like initialize the the different cores. I mean, maybe maybe that oh, yeah. for each. Thank you, Tan. Future something. <laughs> We're getting closer. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm not sure if that if you have to do that for the for the parallel argument to work or or not. It's something I've I've been meaning to ask. Oh, interesting. I can I can try running it. Uh, when I specify like either what people said in the chat, like the parallel package or the future one and see if that, if that speeds things up or not. Cool, so step seven is to evaluate the cross-validation performance. And for that, we'll be using two functions from the workflow sets package. The first one is rank results to rank the models by RMSC. RMSC is our uh, performance metric here. And then we can also use select best inside auto plot to rank models using their best tuning parameter combination. So we can see here that our top models are going to be uh, polynomial SVM and uh, random forest. I think uh, last time, Tony, when you did it, the the bag trees in random forest were one of the worst ones. Um, and it was because you had used like grid equals five. And so I think, yeah, we're seeing the advantage of, of going high 
uh, on these, changes things a little bit. So after previewing and seeing what models uh, did best, we can then just pull uh, the best performing one and then finalize our workflow and then fit it on the full training set and then seeing what the results look like on the test set. So it's a three step process here. And then as expected, our best model is the polynomial SVM. Okay, so <laughs> that concludes uh, our walk through workflow sets. So we'll be sort of switching gears to stacks, but not really because we'll see that it's it's it it's perfectly integrated uh, into this uh, process as expected because it's a tiny models package. But uh, recap on Stacks. So Stacks is a package for ensembling. Uh, ensembling is a process that involves combining the output of many candidate models to generate a new model, which often has superior predictive performance. The combining of the candidate models involves fitting a regularized linear model to the predictions of the candidate models. Uh, you can use other techniques, but that's the one that is currently in stacks. It uses this regular, regularized linear model. And essentially what's happening is the outputs of the candidate models are used themselves as predictors. Uh, for the true outcome variable and so a new model gets generated and new predictions then get generated and that's your ensemble predictions. Each candidate ends up with a beta coefficient which is called a stacking coefficient here and the higher the stacking coefficient the more influential that candidate prediction will be in the ensemble's predictions. And if the stacking coefficient is zero, then that model is not retained. It will not go on to, to influence the ensemble's predictions at all. So there's this nice uh, example infographic on just the steps involved with stacks. So first you start with defining your candidate models, you collect them, you initialize what's called the data stack. So that has like the candidates uh, binded to the true outcome. Uh, you fit this regularized linear model on it. Um, you end up with models having stacking coefficients of zero, which will once again, not be retained. Um, the ones with non-zero coefficients will be retained. And once again, the higher the value, the more influential it will be. And you can, when you go through the implementation, you can see exactly which ones um, had the highest stacking coefficients. And then at the end, you train each candidate with uh, non-zero stacking coefficients. So I've used check marks here just to um, illustrate that we've already gone through steps one and steps two. So we're going to go into the step of setting up our data stack. So first you start with the stacks function like so. Uh, Simon compared it to the ggplot one, so it's just to initialize it. And then you add your candidates 
to it. In this case, we're going to be using res grid, which we've used previously. Can we go get another look at that, please? I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of object, what you saved in there. Res grid? Res grid, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I, I think I've only seen like um, when you do add candidates, like you add like a specific, just one model at a time, but you yeah. actually just pass it the entire result of your uh, work yeah. map. This is cool. This is like the secret sauce I've been was waiting I, for. Was I not supposed to do that? I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome. I'm like, no, it's really like cool. all this magic behind the scenes. Yeah, so I must have passed it. Oh my God, I don't, I don't even want to think about it. I must have passed it like 4,000 models. <laughs> Probably more than that. But it, it, it was really fast. It didn't take long at all. So did you finalize res is this the is this the workflow that you finalized later? Um so you've got res grid and then you found like a like a best fit in, in step eight, right? Yes. Pull workflow services. So we have workflow best there. I'm just is this evaluating performance necessary to do the stacks or is this just kind of like along the way we also figured out which one was the best and, and the, we can kind of cross check that with what's important in the stacks model yeah i guess i was just curious to see which one did best mm -hmm. but then for my ensembling i i didn't want to just pass it the ones that did the best mm -hmm. i wanted to pass it like all the models that I was considering. Um, but that's that's interesting. Maybe I would have, I don't know, it I would be curious to see if I could just pass it like the top like 50 or something and see see if that changes things. I, I can see the argument for doing it, how you did, like even if you passed it 4,000, like it, it, the point of a, of an ensemble model is that it's learning from ones that might, may not be the top 50, right? Like. Maybe, you know, the hundredth most performant model is picking up something weird that the other ones aren't. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I think that's that's the spirit of, of stacks <laughs> and ensembling in a way, right, is to, you know, pick up on certain models that put together with others could, could give you a, a predictive edge. I think, yeah, it, it it was surprisingly really fast. I think if it was like prohibitively slow, I would have probably gone with like the top, the top hundred ranked or, or, or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. It's also probably because it's a, you know, it's a linear model, right? At the bottom, it, I, I wonder how complicated it could be if you had like an ensemble model that was also like a weird, yeah. complicated like an xg boost ensemble or like is that is that a thing yeah so they did mention in the stacks documentation that you know the one the one currently in stacks is this regular regularized linear model but that mm -hmm. there's other ones like um h2o which i'm not sure what it uses and then mm -hmm. super learner yeah those those might get intense um yeah, I was actually, I was going to ask if this is like uh, Stacks itself, can we call that a super learner or is like, I mean, I don't know enough about the terminology super learner. I, I guess in my head, it's just anything that's ensembles other models, but maybe it's more specific than that. Yeah, I think for Stacks, I saw the word meta learner. So I don't know if meta learner is the same thing as like super <laughs> learner which apparently is like its own thing here. So here's, and, and tell me before we get, if we get fully off the rails, um, really you could have, I don't know if this is a super learner that would tune the parameters, right? Because what we did was pass it a whole bunch of, of different tuning parameters and say, okay, here's a bunch of hyperparameters. We don't know which one's the best, but, but you can use any one you want. You know, could a super learner 
I don't know if I'm making sense. To, you know, have its own tune grid. Um, you know, beyond, like, I guess I'm, yeah, a little lost with that. Like, because it's a GloomNet model, right? Like, it's doing some yeah. regularization. So you're saying something more complex than that, right? Uh, where it's the the thought is not super well put, put together. Let's, let's let's skip that. I I have an idea, but I don't I don't know how to how to explain it right. So let's let's, let's skip that. So at Max, yeah. you are watching once again. Let us know some thoughts. All right, so all right, so I've passed it essentially literally all of the models um, took maybe a minute or two. Uh, then the next step is to combine the predictions of the data stack with blend predictions and then we're going to fit the candidates with the non-zero stacking coefficients on the full training set using fit members and i'll note that you can combine all of these i just split it up for the purpose like if you want to go back to the code and just look at things in isolation and like inspect the objects you can, but you can totally just stack all of these together, just like pipe blend predictions right after this one and then fit members right after blend predictions. And then the final step is to get the predictions with predict. And we see here once again that we can just use like bind columns bind rows because everything here is a tibble um, so really really flexible once again i wonder if it's uh smart enough to to work with room augment there so if, like you wanted i don't know the rest of the data back added back to it oh yeah that'd be cool to try And so here is our big reveal. Uh, you know, was it worth it going through uh, ensembling? And the answer is yes, because the RMSC is 0 0.481, and that's the best performing one yet. So maybe that could be your, your secret weapon, Tony, is, is using ensembling in the next sliced competition and see if you can eke out a tiny bit of predictive power. Yeah, I, honestly, that's my thought, right? The ensembling really, you just needed like, it helps with that little edge right at the end. Like if everyone's using the same type of model, you know, uh, ensembling, it's gonna give you a little bit of a boost there. Okay, this, this thought's a little bit more put together um how does the ensemble model work with kind of the test train splits that we had before if it's taking a workflow grid you know is it working within each of those grids to just train like is it just checking on the on the testing data or you know could we overfit based on you know here's a bunch of models that we're trained on the, the whole data set and then taking those outputs and, and using all of the data without any holdout. Hmm. I mean, I guess that, that kind of gets to my question is like, is there I'm, I'm assuming it's using the training data from each of those splits. Uh, so does this like make ensembling like inherently more likely to be overfit? Uh, I'm not sure the answer to that.
I agree with your your intuition that it would want to use the training testing splits that we passed it in the workflow. That makes sense to me. I think I, <laughs> as much as I appreciate like this DAX package is really cool. They've wrapped ensembling into a few little functions. It definitely takes out some of the like the nitty gritty work that that you really know exactly what's going into it. I mean, obviously we can go out and look at the functions and see what's in there. You know, that's that's definitely on on the user to do. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can see that. It feels a little less like uh, granular than something like, I don't know, recipes, uh, where you're like really constructing it from scratch. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't know, that's almost like part of the nature of ensemble. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I get, if it wasn't, if it was using like the tr testing data somehow, um, whenever it's, when it's determining the stack coefficients, then you know, clearly that, or surely that, I don't think that's right, but, you know, it seems like from the diagrams here, it's doing what our, uh, what I thought is like, right, it's only still using the training data, it's just figuring out extra patterns from, you know, across the different models. Hmm. What was the, the next... Can you scroll down a little bit, please? The the next function. So we have stacks, blend predictions, fit members. So I guess that would make sense if if like blend predictions used training data, and then fit members took the coefficients from the the training data and then fitted on the whole data. It took like the, it, it should it take like the weightings of the models and then like actually fits the coefficients of the models on the testing, that, the testing data with fit members. Yeah, that would make sense to me. Yeah. That's kind of how it works in, in tidy models, right? We, we run it through the tune grid, pick your best model, and then you, you, then you have to fit it again. Mm -hmm. Right, All right. Yeah, I think that's I think that's how it's working. It's just different uh, different function names here. How how big was this data? Like I know you picked out about seven or eight columns. Do you remember how many rows? Uh, it was small. I think maybe twelve hundred. Okay. I my problem with with stacks in the past is is that it starts to take a long time, and I like you said this. 1200 rows took four hours. Yeah. I'm, I'm it's, even, little... it's even less than that. It's actually like 149 rows. <laughs> so very small. Whoa. Oh no. So I'm yeah. a little worried about serious? stacked. Yeah. I'm really worried about sliced. But yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah that, that's why I'm a little, yeah, unsure about using it for sliced uh, because of that. I, I think, well, my thought is if I'm going to use it, uh, I would use it for like, Random forest, KN, and uh, linear regression, because those are like three pretty distinct models on how they work, but they're also like, you know, they tune a lot for them. And so you get the most out of stacks by taking like three pretty distinct kind of frameworks. Um, so that, that's honestly my plan there. Don't uh, don't tell people, but. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll have to. Wait, sorry, this. sorry, I need to, I, I think I got confused there. So stacks was really fast. It was oh. the step. Oh, the workflow map, right, was slow. This was slow. This this is the part that took four hours. Yeah, because you had uh, tenfold cross validation for every single line in the workflow map, um, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a hundred times ten times every one of the models in the workflow map in sets. Yeah. But but then again, having a, a parallel backend might have helped. Yeah. I also don't think you would like normally test, I think there's like probably 10 different model frameworks here. I don't think you would normally have that many. I think this is mostly for example. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, Tony, you said you said so yourself last time. This is for like offline exploratory work. Mm -hmm. All right. You want to model hack, figure out which, uh, you know, model works best for you. I, I, I guess knowing what you know now, are there certain models you like better? I, I guess given the way this worked out. I think SVM showed up as pretty yeah. strong at this. And That's... that was that was surprising to me. I yeah. I didn't expect it to do so well. I mean, I, I've seen before that like SVM could be like really good if you give it a like if you try a bunch of different parameters, but most of the time it's going to suck. It's just really hard to like actually get the right parameters. But I don't know if that's completely right. And I'm also surprised that it was actually good in this case. I, I see in the rank results, the random forest is right there next to it on, on, on the first pass. Mm -hmm. Where is XGBoost? Did I do XGBoost? Is that called the bag tree, maybe? GB, I thought I saw GB in there. Yeah, G, there's GB. You know, like 200 trees yeah. might be like probably too much for something <laughs> with uh, 149. <laughs> I really thought it was like a thousand rows. I didn't, I didn't pay attention to that. <coughs> do, you all, do you also dislike uh, this auto plat function? No, I like it. I, I was actually watching your talk again. I was like, why is he hating on that? I mean, can you tell the difference between the shapes there? You <laughs> no. know? I can't tell. No. No. Oh. What are the different shapes there? So formula versus recipe, what are we looking at? Uh, I yeah. think that has to do with how I set up the sets where the first two, mm -hmm. I passed it like a recipe. And then this one I did, I did it differently here yeah. because, uh, or else it wouldn't play nice with stacks for some reason. By the way, there is an issue on the stacks uh, GitHub. I think I think Max put in an issue for it, adding the, uh, the variables interface, uh, which is why we had to use formula for this. Mm -hmm. uh, he put that in in March. I guess we should have realized that. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there are there two K and Ns in that grid? One with formula and one with right. The, the auto plot had. Uh... Yeah, there there is one with like uh, extra polynomial terms and one with just no polynomial terms. So where are we at K and N? Oh goodness. Nearest neighbor. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think they are right next to each other, like five and six with the formula and the recipe. That's cool. They did like exactly the same. It's interesting. So Tony, say it again, what would you do in, in Slice? Like how would you use workflow sets? Would you just like restrict the number of models? Yeah, yeah, I would, oh, like I think here you're doing 10 different model frameworks. <laughs> um, so first of all, reduce that number, but it's also, and I think I've heard Matt, uh, Max say this where he, and I, he tries to pick out different, like actual, like fundamentally different model frameworks. So not picking both you know, random forest and gradient boosting. Although they're, you could arguably say that they're pretty fundamentally different too. But like, uh, you know, you're not gonna do maybe like both a SVM and a KNN or what is SVM close to? Is it KNN? I don't think so, but. There's two like kinds just, of SVM there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Mars is also has like splines terms and all that. Um, I think that's like maybe a better version of like just linear modeling. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, like I just wanted different model frameworks, but also like stuff that didn't don't have like a lot of 
thing like parameters to tune right so with regression you know you don't even have uh, hyper parameters to tune unless you're doing uh, glimnet and you have the uh, mixture and penalty to tune um, with uh, knn it's either the number of neighbors and i think there's another thing like the distance function you want to use distance function right and the min n uh, like how many neighbors uh, mm -hmm. no wait well Okay, that was the first thing I said. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, like a, ran, like a for, random forest where usually, I think um, I've seen before, people will just normally specify trees, like hard code trees, um, you know, kind of depending on the size of the data set. If it's like larger, then maybe do like 500 versus a, or 1,000. If it's smaller like this, maybe it's like 25 or 50. Um, and then try to just uh, tune the M try and What's the other, there's another one, like the number of elements that it needs to split on. Uh, but they, those generally have like less hyperparameters to tune, like right, gradient boosting is like at least four or five that you need to tune. Uh, so I guess that's my strategy, right? Like have a little bit less models to tune, uh, but then also use uh, stacks to kind of like take advantage of like having different model frameworks and, you know, ensembling their predictions. Yeah. I think and this is this is a question I struggled with. I, I asked it one day. And how, how do you know when you can use fewer crossfolds? So, like Jim said, you're you're fitting each of these hundred models ten times for each of the folds, right? And if you have sufficiently big data, you wouldn't need so many crossfolds, right? Like the, like ten is like the default. But let's say you have a ton of data and you want to make it faster. How much data do you need before you can just pick five crossfolds and that would theoretically cut it that that grid in half? I mean, that's a big difference between the four hours training or two hours training, right? Yeah, that's a good question. That comes with experience. <laughs> that's your job. Uh, so I asked this in the in the Slack channel one day, and I I had mentioned I was working with I don't know maybe 180,000 <laughs> rows, and Max is like yeah I think I was, I was trying the Bayesian learning, and Max is like these just take a long time, especially with that much data. So I I didn't get a good feel for is this enough data to to use fivefold instead? Oh okay, I see I see the question like. Like, uh, does your choice of folds, um, does it increase or decrease with maybe like the number, the size of the data? And what are those thresholds? Yeah. One I thing I, I, I wonder on, on this point, um, you have these um, um, like confidence intervals in, in the chart, on the R mm -hmm. RMSE chart, which kind of implies your, your 10 folds of that one algorithm, what, what was the best? The SVM poly. So, so your SVM poly has a an average across all the folds in, indicated in the middle, but the the width of the band is 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 that your your best result and your worst result across all the cross validation. Um, uh, it's um, a standard. It, it, it's based on a. Standard error, I believe. So, so is that standard error from all all ten? You know, the results of all ten of that that um, set of hyperparameters for that SVM poly. Well, and each set of hyperparameters would have run ten times, right? One for each fold. So, right. my intuition is that that error bar would be the range of hyperparameters, not necessarily the range of the folds within each hyperparameter. I could be wrong. Yeah, uh, I, I see one thing. She said select best here. So it just oh. shows the one of, of the, the best set of hyperparameters in this chart. Okay. So this would be all the folds of the best oh. set of hyperparameters. Hyper so coming back to tenfold versus fivefold, I, yeah. I, I just wonder if going with five would maybe not give you the right sense of your 
you know, confidence in that uh, performance metric. Yeah, I mean, I could see that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the error bars might be wider. That'd be an interesting, like, case study, right? Here's what this chart looks like with fivefold versus tenfold and whether or not the error bars are larger. I, I'd look at this and say, you know, man, that, that, that random forest is pretty much the same, the best random forest. Mm. Right? Yeah, I'd say so too. Anyway, uh, I was glad to see you did the uh, ANOVA, which is different than... Can you imagine if I hadn't? <laughs> take like a day to run regular grid so you probably saved some time oh yeah yeah i think the book had said that it like with without a nova it would take just four times as long to run just insane so is there any is there any downside to to doing a nova like should we be doing that every time Honestly, I think so. I mean, I guess it's possible that you miss out on some, like, you know, it stops early and doesn't uh, actually find the most optimal uh, set of hyperparameters. So I guess that's that's the risk. But, you know, I will, I will, at some point you're, like, talking about, like, hundreds of a digit with RMSE. So it yeah. just depends, maybe. I think that's the trade-off I'm giving up. I, I tried the Bayesian methods, which are really cool, but they took too long, and I, I actually stopped working on the model because, like, this is frustrating. Like, it's not that that hundredth of a digit, like you said, is not worth giving up on a model when you could use this racing thing again and actually get it done. You just need like a supercomputer, like go to a university and ask for all their <laughs> compute cluster. Then I'll I'll never learn how I'm supposed to do it. I'll just keep hiding behind <laughs> these awesome functions. They're they're doing the most impactful research, right? Yeah. Universities. I don't. I mean, I don't know. I'm just. Um. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I think I don't know if there, there's any more, but I think uh, it's oh. really helpful. Hopefully, hopefully no one's watching. Hopefully, this is my secret to use. At least for the first week of a slice. I won't, I won't, I won't share the, the R markdown. <laughs> well, let's embargo the video. It can't go on YouTube for two weeks. <laughs> yeah. John is so busy too. He may not even get to it. Yeah. For June. This really yeah. Happy to, happy to send this RMD to anyone who wants it before then. Please. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, never mind. Um, just uh, thinking, I guess I can try to build on this, try to apply it for next week. Oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. What What are you thinking of doing with it? Well, yeah, now I'm thinking like it should still be a small data set if I'm going to do this like uh, <laughs> yeah. actually live, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, I had, I'm going to probably look through the recent uh, Tidy Tuesday data sets. Um, See if there's something interesting there. I think what was it this week was like Mario or yes. something. Yeah. Oh, I want to see Mario Kart. <laughs> Although, like, I don't know. Do people get tired of seeing Tidy Tuesday data sets? I don't know. No. I don't. I mean, Julia does a you know that screencast, and that's always fresh for me. Like, I, I don't look as many graphics. I'd, I'd rather watch her model with it. Okay. Yeah. I'll. Just try to find something small. I think that's a priority to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about these sessions where we sort of try to integrate different packages and tidy models and put them together. Because it's, at least for me, it's helping me see like the forest <laughs> <laughs> from like the branches, which you know, that's valuable too. When you, when you started the presentation, you said you had 
uh, something about stacks on your plate and another little logo is pancakes. I was laughing because I, I thought it was a pun about the pancakes on the plate. Oh. <laughs> Well, um, all right, so we shall adjourn. Have a good night, guys. Thanks, Osmond. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Osmond. Bye.